you, uh, Robin. All right. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you for tuning in this afternoon to my um, talk. And thank you for the introduction, Lucy, and the invitation to give this seminar. Um, so, as Lucy said, I'm a geologist and I sit in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Cape Town. And I'm also the director of the Human Evolution Research Institute, the same institute. And um, yes, today I'm going to be talking about um, my research in human evolution in South Africa. Um, hmm. Sorry, going to the next slide. All right, so um, I would like to talk to you about three things this afternoon. Um, and those are carbonates, chronology, and decolonization. So carbonates are terrestrial, the carbonates that I work on are terrestrial rocks, basically made of calcium carbonate. Um, I work in two main areas in South Africa, and I'll um, take you to both of those field areas and both are associated with early human evolution. Um, and then the other piece of work, main part of my research is chronology. So that is working out how old things are. And in this case, it's those carbonate rocks. And the technique I use to do this is uranium series dating. So specifically the uranium thorium and uranium lead chronometers. So in this like nice Venn diagram, my research, um, Sorry, it's not, I've just got to concentrate for moving my slides ahead, there we go. So my research basically sits at the intersection of carbonates and the U-series chronometer. Um, but what I'm going to do today is to, instead of just doing a talk on carbonates and uranium series dating, is that I'm going to take us here into the intersection of carbonates, uranium series chronology and decolonization. Um, I, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous. This is the first time I have publicly done this. And um, I just think that here we are in 2021 and it's um, it's really time for these kind of public discussions. So um, we will start off with the carbonates. Um, so by way of introduction, this is a beautiful map of the African continent. And what it's showing is the key places where we find many early hominin fossils. So we know from genetic evidence and fossil evidence that the oldest records of human evolution um, are found in Africa. And the um, countries in Eastern Africa running down the um, East African Rift Valley, so from Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, um, we have incredible early hominin sites, um, which have been the subject of much research. But the other single richest place of early hominin fossils is here in South Africa in the cradle of humankind. Um, and the, so this is one of the field areas which I'll be talking about. And then the other place is um, over here in the Southern Kalahari Basin. So on this side of the screen, there's two photographs of these field areas. So the host rock in both places is the same. It's the Transvaal group Dolomites, um, which is important because this is the um, source of the carbonate that forms the secondary carbonates that I work on. And so here you can see a rock shelter, which I will um, come back to. This is the site of Hamahana. And the top picture is the, um, a photograph of the early hominin site of Stokefontein. So Stokefontein is found in the cradle of humankind. And this is a relatively small area with a lot of caves. And um, as you can see in this insert map, um, the initials are the names of the various hominin bearing cave sites. Um, and as you can see from the photograph from Stokefontein, um, it's a little underwhelming as a cave and probably not what you were expecting to see for a picture of a cave. And this is because there's been a lot of surface erosion. So between 15 to even up to 30 meters of surface material has been eroded. So what we're seeing are the kind of roots of these ancient paleo caves and the deposits exposed at the surface are the oldest ones and the younger, even modern deposits are currently underground. So what you can see in this slide are, um, I hope you can see some kind of reddish brown rocks and some paler whiter rocks. So um, much has been made of the complexity of these deposits, but if we boil them down to just like two components, we have um, sediments which get washed in from the outside and that's where we find the fossils. 
and then we get these secondary cave carbonates. Um, and yeah, we'll spend a moment talking about cave carbonates. So speleotherm is a kind of catch-all phrase to describe secondary carbonates that form in a cave. And um, in this photo of a very rosy-cheeked, very excited, dirty, younger version of me, um, you can see stalactites growing down from the roof of the cave and stalagmites growing up from the bottom. And the reason I look so thrilled is that the dark wet material that you can see on the floor of the cave literally flowing away from the central drip point. This is known as a flowstone. So this is where you get horizontally embedded layers of calcium carbonate. It's the same material as stalagmites and stalactites, um, but it flows along the floors of the caves. And so this is in the Naracor Caves in Australia and is a modern example. But in the cradle of humankind, we find um, yeah, these flowstone layers and actually a ubiquitous feature at all of the sites. So on the other side of the screen, there's a field photograph from the site of Bolt's farm. And you can see here these reddish brown sediments and that's where you get the fossils and then interbedded between these are these flowstone layers. Um, and you can see these are pretty thick and they, we find places where they're even thicker, they can be over a meter in thickness. So what we know about speleotherms is that in order for them to form inside a cave, you have to meet a specific set of conditions. You have to kind of tick all these boxes. So the, probably the most important thing is that you need a positive water balance inside the cave. And what this basically equates to is a period of increased effective precipitation outside the cave. And um, the speleotherms, so it basically it needs to rain more. So you get more water coming through the aquifer into the cave um, and forming these secondary carbonates. Um, but flowstones in particular are very fussy. If the cave is open and sediments have been washed in, um, if the air is circulating too much, and if say animals are moving in and out of the cave, this actually disrupts the um, formation of flowstones from a crystal by crystal basis and they will stop forming. So in order to form great big thick flowstones of over a meter, not only do you need an increase in precipitation, but the caves need to be pretty much blocked to everything else that can come into them. So the, yeah, these become useful markers in dividing up the um, plastic sediments where we find the fossils. And the great utility of speleotherms and flowstones in this setting is that we can date them. So the bulk of my um, research has focused on adapting the uranium series chronometer to work on speleotherms, particularly in the South African setting. And so um, the uranium series chronometer is based on the natural radioactive decay of uranium-238. Um, and you can see on your screen, there's a one of the uranium series decay chains starting with uranium-238 which decays through a number of daughter isotope products, one of which is thorium-230, and that decay from uranium to thorium is the uranium-thorium chronometer. But thorium itself is radioactive, and this decay chain continues all the way down until we reach stable 206 lead. So um, uranium-thorium dating is very useful in a kind of keystone technique for quaternary geology, um, and is, we can use it from a few thousand years to about half a million. And older than this, you can use uranium lead dating. So you can use this technique from around 100,000 years back to billions of years. And the um, way that this chronometer works in carbonates is based on the enormous solubility differences between uranium and the daughter isotopes in groundwaters. So uranium is super soluble in groundwater and thorium and lead are not. So they get separated basically from each other in the groundwater. And this technique is also known as uranium disequilibrium dating. And it's because um, we are separating these isotopes and breaking this um, decay chain. And so as the secondary carbonates, so for example, as our flowstone forms in the cave, crystal by crystal, the uranium gets locked into the calcite. And the premise is that there's no thorium or lead so you've basically started a clock ticking and that uranium begins to decay in situ. And um, this picture on the slide is a photomicrograph. So that's a hundred micron scale. And these are individual calcite crystals in a flowstone from the cradle. And these needles you can see in them are relict aragonite needles. 
And it's in these that the uranium is actually sitting and decaying. And we know the rate at which uranium decays. So what we can do today is measure the amount of uranium and the, say, the amount of lead, and we can solve the decay equation and work out how much time has passed for that amount of uranium to make that amount of lead. Um, it is all a little bit more complicated than that. And you get, there's more than one isotope of thorium. There's a whole lot of lead isotopes and they're not perfectly insoluble in water. So what I just told you, yeah, I was kind of low grade lying a moment ago. So um, it's a lot more complicated. We have to measure all these isotopes. There's various checks and balances, um, but it's a, a complex system. So um, before you embark on this complex dating um, procedure, um, having enough uranium in the first place is really important. So the only thing that I really discovered in my PhD is that you will have much higher success rates with dating cave carbonates if you have some kind of pre-screening, if you can look for the uranium in the samples. So uranium is not evenly distributed in cave carbonates. And so there's um, two methods. One is a kind of passage, passive um, radio kind of imaging method where we used radioactive sensitive imaging plates. And this is kind of analogous to an X-ray you can see this is a slice of stalagmite. And you can see these layers here. And those are the actual growth layers within the stalagmite. And the darker layers have emitted more radiation, which we assume to be uranium. So we can then target those and date those. Then the other thing you can do is use laser ablation. So you cut up little slices of your sample and the laser remains stationary, but the stage underneath the laser moves. And so you can laser a continuous pathway along your sample. And the laser literally blasts off little bits of speleotherm and it gets blown through into a mass spectrometer in real time. And um, you can choose what you want to measure. So I would measure the uranium and lead concentrations. And then you can plot those up in space. And this is a more quantitative method of doing it because you get actual concentrations. And so this little example here you can see the black is the concentration of uranium and the gray is the concentration of lead. And you can choose layers which have high uranium concentration and low lead and target those for dating. Um, and once you've decided which layer you're going to measure, then you can cut out little blocks or drill powder and then extract the uranium, thorium and lead isotopes and measure those. Um, so when I was starting this work, um, uranium lead dating was a really new chronometer and we were quite worried about whether it actually worked and a lot of time went into validating the chronometer and then looking at the quality of the age data. So I realized when I was putting this talk together that the plot on the slide is nearly 10 years old. So I think we've graduated from being an emerging technique to a pretty well established technique. And um, I'm sure the um, this Plot is taken from two publications which John Woodhead and I at the University of Melbourne had worked on and put together all of the uranium lead um, age calculations between the two of us that existed from our pooled work. But as I said, this is nearly 10 years old and probably really needs an update. But this is just a plot to get a measure of the quality of the, age, the of uranium lead speleotherm ages. So this is an age on a logarithmic scale. And this is the percentage uncertainty um, and the dark, the filled in circles are isochron analyses and the, um, so which require a lot of analysis and the open circles were from single aliquot model ages, but altogether this is, um, represents over 150 analyses, which was a lot 10 years ago. Um, and the good news is that a comfortingly large amount of these ages fall below the 10% error range. And if you compare this to other chronometers, something like luminescence dating OSL, um, normal error ranges are 10% or even higher. So we're doing really well, actually. And then a reassuring number of ages are even within the 1% um, error margin. So if we then take um, this chronometer and have a go at dating the caves in the cradle, um, which is the work I did primarily for my PhD. And this is an example from Swatkrantz, one of the famous hominin sites. And um, 
This is the hanging remnant, the wall of sediment known as the hanging remnant. And there is this kind of reddish brown um, externally derived clastic sediments where you find the fossils. And then at the base of the sequence is um, a flowstone and then it's capped off by another piece of flowstone. So I very carefully um, took samples from both of those flowstones and selected out the um, layers to date. And then the next panel are the actual calculations that we use to make those ages. Um, but in a nutshell, the results we got was that the lower flowstone was around 2.25 million and the top layer was 1.8 million. And this means that the sediments that are found sandwiched in between those two layers must date to the time in between these two ages. So this is important because um, this is where we find the hominins. And these are some little teeth from the site of Coopers. And this is normally all that we find are isolated teeth um, because they are more resistant and survive in the fossil record. But every now and again, you find really spectacular fossils and this is Australopithecus sediba, which was discovered or announced in 2010. And the uranium lead ages of the flowstones from that site were one of the te techniques that were able to really narrow down this age. Um, so if we then zoom out and look at the whole cradle, this is a really busy slide, but stay with me. So um, there's the map of the cradle showing all the various fossiliferous sites and four of them are marked. And these were the sites which I had worked um, on doing the dating. So Sturkfontein, Swartkrantz, um, Malapa and Coopers, which are major hominin bearing sites. And much has been made of the complexity of the geology of these sites that it's basically too complicated to understand. And um, the sites, you can't correlate the sites to each other. And their long held belief that they were kind of undateable because the geological setting is different to that in Eastern Africa. And without the volcanic activity and interbedded ash layers, um, which we don't have in caves, that these were impossible to date. Um, so as a kind of ambitious PhD student, this didn't deter me. I was like, I'm sure, you know, it'll be fine. <laughs> so um, again, if you kind of just boil down the cave deposits to the two simplest end members of what you can get in a cave. You get speleotherm layers and you get these sediment layers. And so the stratigraphic columns that I'm showing for these four sites were, was my take on the geology of each one of these sites. And the yellow layers are the, the flowstone layers and the brown layers are the sediment. And um, at all these sites, there's this recurring pattern of this kind of sandwiching of like flowstone sediment, flowstone sediment. So um, wherever you see a white star, that is where I took a uranium lead sample. And what I was able to do was to date all of these flowstones. So I dated the underlying and capping flowstone of all the major hominin bearing layers from these sites. And um, you can take those ages for the flowstones and then figure out ages for the sediments sandwiched in between them and kind of extrapolate that to give ages for the hominins found at all of these sites, um, which is great. And is the first time we've really had a chronology for the South African deposits. But as I was kind of pulling all of this work together, I kept noticing that there were similarities in the ages. And if you just look at the slide, you'll see the same numbers keep cropping up. So um, 2 million, 1.8 million, 2.2 million, and I was yeah, convinced that I was seeing some kind of a pattern. So if we look at um, some other sites in the cradle, not just those four, um, there's this repeated patterns of flowstone sediment, flowstone sediment, and this is a ubiquitous pattern across all the sites. And um, it's a relatively small area. And um, we know that the speleotherms can only form when the conditions are just right and we can date them and we're getting this pattern in the ages. So kind of putting all of this together um, and come up with something of a kind of cradle wide predictive model. And if we, so this is a cycle, it doesn't really matter where you start, but if we start here with flowstones because they're ubiquitous at all the caves and they can be incredibly thick over a meter. 
So we know these flow stones only form in specific conditions. And um, those conditions are that it's raining more, basically it's the wet phase. And the cradle is a small area. And so all the caves would experience the same climatic conditions at the same time in a general sense. There's always gonna be some site specific conditions and kind of nuances, but in general, the caves should all experience, will, will all experience the same conditions. So they should all record flow stones of the same age. Then um, what we know about the climate between say three and one million years ago is it fluctuated a lot and we get kind of global shifts between wetter and drier climates. So as we go around our cycle, um, the climate begins to dry out, we get less rain, there's less vegetation, the caves open up, um, the soil profiles build up outside the cave and something like a flash flood would wash the sediments and um, bones into the caves as one taphonomic model for introducing these um, materials into the caves. Um, and this is certainly consistent with the sedimentology of some of the deposits. And while this is an arid, arid phase, it's not the Sahara, like it's still raining and there's still, we're in an arid phase today relatively, um, and it still rains. So there would still be enough rain to wash sediment into the caves, but not enough to go into flowstone mode. Um, and then I'll, if we keep going around the cycle, then like we shift back into a wetter climate um, and eventually reach this tipping point where there's more rain, more vegetation, we kind of block up the cave entrances and kind of click the whole system back into flowstone mode. Um, and so the predictions of this model is that we would find flowstones of the same age across all the caves in the cradle. And so, um, yeah, another busy slide, but stay with me. So along the bottom axis of this slide is a timeline. So going from 3.4 million to 1 million. And then um, the panel above that is showing the, all the uranium lead ages from the cradle sites. Um, so there's 29, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it took 10 years to get there. And the individual sites are just listed in alphabetical order with the number of ages per site. The actual ages are shown as the diamonds and the whiskers on the diamonds are the error ranges on those individual ages. And if you just look at the ages, there's definitely some patterns. You can see ages kind of clustering together, but with the errors, it's very difficult to really tease out because um, yeah, are we really seeing flowstones forming at the same time or not? It's not easy to see. So what we did is we used two statistical methods to sum together these ages into a, basically a single record. And that's what the panel above is showing. So there's a histogram, you can see the bars of the histogram and then sitting on top of that is a single curve from a kernel density estimate or a KDE. And so this sums together all the ages and the peaks in the KDE represent um, times when there's a lot of flowstone forming, basically. And we know that flowstones can only form under these specific conditions, which are mainly governed by increased rain. So they are wetter times. So we can define these wet periods based on the peaks of flowstone formation. And we call these flowstone growth intervals. And then if we specifically look within these time windows then, we've got um, up to five caves in the cradle recording flowstones during these time intervals. So this basically, um, the KDE gives us a way to sum together all of these data into a single record and define these wet periods. And then um, those are the peaks and then the troughs are when there is low flowstone or no flowstone at all. And so these by definition have to be more arid phases. So they are yellow. <laughs> And these are defined as sedimentary intervals. And lo and behold, when we went back to all the um, other ages, so things like the biochronological ages for the various fossil bearing strata from all of the sites, they fit into the time periods defined by this flowstone chronology. So um, there's a number of implications of this. Um, so the first one being that this hominin record from the cradle of humankind is highly punctuated. 
There are long periods of time in the fossil record that are just simply unrecorded in the caves because flowstone was forming in the caves at that time. And this is based on this kind of simple dichotomy that we aren't going to get huge thick flowstones and massive sediments accumulating at the same time, that these two modes of preservation are mutually exclusive. Um, and this concept of non-continuous deposition is by no means a new idea. So Bob Brain had suggested this for decades in his work on the cradle and his 1995 paper very eloquently proposes this as a hypothesis. But what we were able to do is really test that and then now constrain these times of deposition and pinpoint the gaps. Um, so the times when the caves are open and able to receive and preserve sediments, these are relatively dry times by definition. And what this means is that this carries therefore an inherent dry bias in the entire fossil record from the cradle. So this places the hominins in an arid adapted community of flora and fauna, which is not, um, and these collections have never really been viewed through that lens. Um, and it also skews things like hominid behavior to these dry conditions. So think of hominid dietary behavior of which there's been some really beautiful um, studies, but we are actually only seeing the ad adaptations to a relatively dry climate. Um, so this punctuated record could make the hominin record itself appear more punctuated than it actually is and can obscure long-term patterns of evolutionary change in lineages, which is taking us all the way into very fundamental kind of evolutionary theory and things like the turnover pulse hypothesis is that is this a good explanation of what we see preserved in the caves now that we know that the record is very punctuated. So this all seems like quite bad news, but the good news is that the flowstones themselves hold enormous potential as paleoclimate archives. The field of research of paleoclimatology on stalagmites is huge and very well developed, um, but has been less well and kind of investigated in flowstones. So these flowstones do hold enormous potential um, for local records for the cradle, as well as even informing on other records from the region and even as far away as the Eastern African record. And um, so kind of overall, this is the first direct and comprehensive chronology for the South African sites. And it brings the South African record back into kind of modern discussions on hypotheses of human evolution. And we can begin to investigate the roles of climate parameters um, in forcing this evolution. So, um, this is some ongoing work um, of kind of how do we actually test this hypothesis? So how do we actually look closer at these flow stones? So this is the work led by my um, wonderful postdoc, Dr. Tara Edwards, who's pictured here, and um, our three very courageous honor students, which is our fourth year in South Africa. So Zandi Rothman, Aidan Wilton, and Sina Tembo Nachani. And um, they, you can see them here in the slide on their COVID compliant um, honors field trip where they went and visited the Kango Caves in South Africa. And so what um, these guys were all doing is looking at um, younger speleotherms. So the beautiful stalagmite on the slide is um, also from one of the younger caves in the cradle. And what we could do is use a uranium thorium chronology for a younger carbonate and look at the um, trace element and stable light isotope record with um, where it's well constrained chronology um, and try and understand what these records look like where we know the chronology very well and we have lots of other records to compare them to. And then we can use this as an analog to try and interpret the paleoclimate signals preserved in the much older flowstones. Um, and Tara's work in particular has been looking at the um, microstratigraphic fabrics and how well preserved, particularly the old flowstones are, and how, how faithful recorders they are of these paleoenvironmental changes. Um, and if we can understand how, when, and why we get these good paleoclimate signals, we can begin to build up a picture of what is actually going on in these paleoclimate archives during this very interesting time of hominin diversification from these cradle sites. So, um, I'm going to leave the cradle and caves now, and we're going to go on to my um, other field area. So, um, here we're going to the um, 
Northern Cape in South Africa. So um, this is the field area over here. And I get to introduce two of my other amazing members of my research group. So Jessica von der Meeden, who's a PhD student, and Wendy Kamalo, who's a master student. And um, this is really their work, which they very generously let me present. Um, so what you can see in the field photograph is um, the Hamahana hillside. And this is the same bedrock. It's the dolomite bedrock. And you can see the steps in the dolomite. And um, there's a very big rock shelter, which there has been um, excavations, new excavations led by Jane Wilkins and Ben Scoville have um, revealed very exciting new Middle Stone Age deposits. Um, we have a paper coming out on this, which is about to drop in nature, and I'm not going to say anything more about it now. Um, but the rest of the hillside away from the shelter is covered in carbonate, in secondary carbonate. And these open air freshwater carbonates are known as tufas. And if you look at this annotated sketch that Jessica did of the hillside, um, all of these various gray and stippled formations are the carbonate. So this hillside is covered in carbonate. Um, and so we set out to document these carbonates and investigate them and ultimately date them to provide a local paleoclimate record as the content co context for the new archaeological um, excavations. And it also became very clear that, I mean, this is an arid region today, and these tufas are indicating a very different environment with like waterfalls pouring down the hillside. So understanding the modern climatology as a, um, a kind of a key to understanding what was happening in the past, um, we realized was important very on, and this is what Wendy Kamalo has worked on. So um, this is an overview of Jess's work in um, documenting and categorizing the various tufa formations. So there are about five major types of tufa that she identified on the landscape. And they form a continuum of different types of tufa that all form from um, basically rainwater percolating down into the dolomite aquifer and then seeping out along bedding plains. And these waters are super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate and um, mainly from the turbulent flow of kind of flowing down the sides of the hillside, as well as the action of microbes, you get degassing and loss of CO2 and the calcium carbonate comes out of solution and you build out these tufas. Um, so Jess was able to identify these different types of tufas, but they all fit together into this kind of continuum of depositional environments. And this is a lovely field photograph where you can see examples of the tufa cascades that kind of fall down the sides of the um, hillside. And these would have been waterfalls when they were forming. And we get things like these domes, which look a little bit like stalagmites. Um, and they've kind of grown from being dripped on by the water coming cascading down. And um, these are my favorites. These are rim pools. So um, this is where there would have been shallow pools of standing water and then these kind of cascades of water flowing down um, the side, the hillside. And um, in this photograph, so we initially started trying to date these cascades and we got Holocene ages, which was a little bit disappointing because we were getting much older Middle Stone Age archaeology out of the shelter. So um, Jess and I spent a lot of time stamping around in the field and we found these huge ex situ cascades that had broken off the dolomite um, rock face. And so they were ex situ, but they must have once been attached and they hadn't been moved very far. And on this one here, you can see the um, kind of layers of sequential tufa development as these have built out across the um, rock face. So we took little drill core samples out of these to try and date them. And this is just a photo micrograph um, looking under the microscope at this kind of rock. And you can definitely see these sequential layers. So they're a little bit like tree rings. And this is likely seasonal variation. So wet and dry seasons. Um, so yeah, this is really the, the incredible potential archives. Um, and so now if we talk about the, the, the carbonates, if we talk about the chronometer, um, uranium thorium is this very well-established technique. It works beautifully on stalagmites, but it's never been 
applied widely to tufa because tufa forms in this open air setting and um, you can just see how dirty these tufas are they are wet they get covered in dust they dry out they wet again there's microbes so most normal uranium thorium stalagmite people would run a mile at <laughs> trying to date these um but yeah jess was just incredibly persistent and she took these little drilled out samples and used the laser ablation pre-screening technique. And here you can see these are tracks from the laser and she's measured the uranium and thorium concentrations and the warm colors are higher concentrations and the darker colors are lower concentrations. And so what Jess was able to do is pick out these layers like this one, which have low thorium concentrations. And so the thorium is the biggest problem in these samples because it's a contaminant. So she was able to, and then, yeah, having been able to quantify where these layers are and then kind of get her eye in. And then this is a centimeter. So these are little samples, incredibly carefully drill out just those layers and um, uranium thorium date them. And um, this is a similar plot to the one that I showed you with the cradle, but on a different time scale. So this is 120,000 years ago to the present. And again, the diamonds are Jess's actual uranium thorium ages and the whiskers are the error. And if you can't see the whiskers, that's because they, the errors are smaller than the actual symbols we've used for the ages, which is amazing in dating a, a carbonate that most people avoid because it's too hard. Um, so yeah, we employed a similar technique here by summing together the ages using a histogram and a KDE. And we know that the tufas can only form basically when it's raining more and there's water kind of pouring down the hillside. And what we were excited to discover is that they are Holocene tufas, but they um, there is a lot older tufas as well. And tufa formation is not continuous through the past. It's very punctuated. And it's hinting again at these wet and dry cycles. Um, and um, Wendy's work on the modern climatology showed that this is a late summer rainfall region and that no single climate driver controls the rain in this area. So the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures are important and the Southern Oscillation Index. But this today, this region gets so little rain that it's very sensitive to any change in ocean atmosphere dynamics can actually cause more rain because there's so little today. And so this time period between 100 and 110,000 years is where we get the very exciting archeology. span And it's when we have a lot of tufa. So the hillside was basically pouring with water. And Wendy's work showed that from Indian Ocean and um, Marine Corps records, that this is a time of warmer Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures, which was likely driving this increased rainfall. So, um, yeah, altogether, this is very exciting work where we're able to produce this very local um, record of the hydroclimate, which we can then relate to the occupation at the rock shelter. So at this stage, I'm going to leave my comfort zone of carbonates and chronology. And I'm going to spend the last little bit of my talk talking about decolonization. So I suppose as a scientist, I feel comfortable with definitions and it feels like a good place to start. So there are many definitions of decolonization and it um, is difficult to kind of pin down to just one thing. Um, but, and I encourage you to do reading around this topic. I am um, the glossary that I found particularly useful is the racialequitytools.org. Um, and they have a lot of other very good resources, but there are many, many very good online resources. So the definition I have on the slide is the act of resistance against colonial powers and the shifting towards of, of power towards political, economic, educational, cultural, psychic independence and power that originates from a colonized nation's own indigenous culture. And this process occurs politically, but also applies to the personal, um, societal, psychic, cultural, political, agricultural and educational. And this is all with a view to deconstructing colonial oppression. And why is this important? Why am I suddenly changing gears from carbonates and chronologies and talking about decolonization? And I think the answer to this is that it depends how you see science and how you view 
the scientific endeavor. Whether you see science as this um, kind of thing that stands on its own and is kind of empirical and um, kind of above what's happening around it. Or if science is part of the context and the context and the society is intrinsically linked into how science is produced and who does the science. And so, yeah, I have been told by a white male colleague that science is imperial and cannot be decolonized. But I think where we're sitting in 2021, we basically know that science is a product of the context and the society in which it's done and who is doing it and who has access to the resources to do it. So the context is becomes very important. And so if we look at the context in which the science of human evolution in South Africa has done um, and has historically been done, this is what we see. So I'm not going to labor this point, but the dominant figures of South African paleoanthropology for the last hundred years have been men, white men, and almost all of them foreign white men. So these are the people who have controlled the narratives, controlled the funding, controlled the access, and kind of set the stage for all of research into human evolution in South Africa. They've been exceptions, of course, but this is the kind of dominant picture, this very patriarchal narrative of human evolution. So I have to take a moment now to talk about myself and my own privilege. So thank you, mom and dad, for cracking into the family album and sending me these photos. So apart from having apparently having the same hairstyle my entire life and my dad rocking very short shorts in the early 80s. And um, yeah, I'm a white middle class woman. I grew up in Johannesburg during the end of apartheid. And um, yeah, in terms of my access to education, primary education, secondary and tertiary, um, I have I come from an incredibly privileged background. So um, this is not to say my parents didn't work very hard. They made enormous sacrifices to give me that access to education. And I certainly grew up in a politically aware family, but it's worth acknowledging that um, I am still the direct descendant of the colonizers of South Africa. So I'm actually you know, a colonist as much as my ancestors were. And me as the director of a human evolution institute, um, as a white woman who grew up in an oppressive regime, but on the right side of it, like on the privileged side, um, that I'm not really any different to the white men who've controlled those narratives. So while geology is certainly a male dominated field, I don't actually represent a minority group. Um, and so why is this important? Why have I just kind of banged on about this? So there's four kind of key concepts that um, are the kind of where we are and where we would like to be in this process of decolonization. And these are equity or equality, equity, liberation and inclusion. And again, there's many, many fabulous online resources. And this is by no, like I am by no means an expert on this. And the little cartoon shows is a kind of graphical representation of what these mean. And um, my ideal situation and where I would love to see our science be is where we have inclusion and um, an inclusive research institute is what I strive to lead. But in terms of where we really are in terms of equality and equity, um, yeah, we have a long way to go and a lot to think about. So it's not all bad news. Um, if we look at paleoanthropology in South Africa right now, at two of the universities in South Africa with institutes dedicated to human evolution, the um, leaders of those institutes are women. Um, if we look at museums that have an archeology span or human evolution kind of aspect, um, four of the curators of those are women and we are all South African. And um, Dupuyo, Tammy and Miriam and I all studied together at FITS during May, more or less the same time. So it's fabulous that we've actually all found um, positions, permanent positions in paleoanthropology in South Africa. So this is great and something to be really celebrated and is um, certainly changing the face of paleoanthropology in South Africa. But 
there is a tendency, particularly among white scholars, to kind of pat ourselves on the back and celebrate these wins. And um, the problem with just doing that is that it doesn't leave space to continue to grow and to do better. And you also kind of gaslight the people who, um, whose experiences aren't mirrored in this. And so, yeah, this is all good, but it's not enough. And so if we think more about decolonization and what we, what we can actually do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the personal and then the institutional. So um, language really matters. And this is something which each of us can be mindful of. So Africa is not a country. <laughs> And I'm showing you a political map of Africa with the many countries that make up Africa. And I have heard this many times that I'm, people say, oh, I'm going to do field work in Africa. I guarantee you, you are not doing field work in Africa. You are doing field work in Ethiopia or um, Angola or Zambia. <laughs> like, and um, I think perhaps that people are not specific about where they're doing field work because they fear that their audience won't have heard of these countries. But the, the problem with saying, I'm going to Africa, why do field work in Africa, is that this is actually a very deeply held colonial notion where Africa is kind of the heart of darkness and this huge homogenous mass, um, which it's not at all. <laughs> this enormous, enormous diversity. And yeah, so. Be specific, educate your audience. If they don't know where Ethiopia is, tell them. So this is one of my, my worst things, the African, African human peri humid period. So this is um, a hypothesis to explain um, a climate perturbation seen during the Holocene. But yeah, I, I really don't like this. So again, this is a map showing you just how big Africa, and this is fitting in almost every other continent in the world can be accommodated in the land mass of Africa. So it's a really big place. And on this map, you can see there's the Tropic of Capricorn, the equator and the Tropic of Cancer. This is a huge area with hugely complex climate systems. The idea that the entire African continent could experience a humid period at the same time is almost farcical. And again, it's going back to this deeply held, maybe not intentional, but kind of colonial notion of the heart of darkness and homogeny. So please don't use the African humid period. Um, and then finally, yeah, the act actual colonial terms. So this is a colonial map of Africa from 1930. It's not even 100 years old. And the pink on this map are the former British colonies. And Cecil John Rhodes was famous for saying his dream was for the whole of Africa to be pink. And the one I want to zoom into is British East Africa. So um, yeah, the, if, you, if you mean the hominin record from Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, it's much better to say Eastern Africa because this is what it is actually. It's a region of Eastern Africa actually saying East Africa is literally using a terrible old colonial term. And then extractive field practices. So this is not a topic I'm going to labor, but basically, and it's, yeah, there's different. Look up Becky Ackerman's seminar on extractive field practices and yeah, educate yourself on your own white privilege and the history of our field. So yeah, there's some resources on the screen which are really, really fabulous. And there's many, many more. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, and from an institutional point of view, what we are trying to do at UCT with the Human Evolution Research Institute is to create an institute that's centered on inclusion and diversity and creating an atmosphere in which people who had historically been excluded can kind of thrive and just do their science. Um, and we have different approaches. And um, the one is supporting um, black Southern African um, female scholars and Precious Tiwara and Riveningo Kosa are two advancing women fellows um, who are both doing really groundbreaking research into aspects of human evolution and kind of yeah, watch the space. And then the other, one of the other things we did was we ran a all women's field camp for our undergraduate women from geology and archaeology, the kind of feeder disciplines into human evolution, 
to give these young scholars a informative, safe, and even fun field experience with a view to trying to retain them in the discipline. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm now basically finished. So if we kind of wrap this all up, um, we have rich records of carbonate rocks associated with important human evolution sites in South Africa. We can, um, our ability to provide U series ages has got a, a chronology for the early hominin sites and context for the early modern human record in the Southern Kalahari. Um, there are inherent paleoclimate signals in these carbonates, but they are complex, um, but we're working on that. And yeah, Africa holds a rich record of human evolution, but the investigation of this record has historically left out many voices. Um, there's no quick fix to decolonization, but doing nothing makes things worse. So be part of the solution. And I really believe we are entering an exciting and challenging new era in our field. And finally, a very long list of acknowledgements, but I would particularly like to thank my research group who are all listed there. And I'd like to acknowledge my children for leaving me alone for the last hour. And finally, thank you all very much for your attention. And um, I really hope you have some questions for me. Thank you very much, Robin. That was an absolutely excellent talk. And um, yeah, really important to have these uh, difficult conversations, I think. So um, we'll go into the uh, Q&A now. Uh, we have already got a question in the chat um, from Robin. So I did my field work in 1979, what is now Gauteng during apartheid, working with two women, one a South African who was involved in, in support of black prisoners. Aren't you oversimplifying? Um, thank you, Robin. Um, yes, I suppose, of course, I am. And there's only so much you can do in a 45 minute talk. I already went over my time. So yes, and this is complicated and nuanced. And as I said, I am by no means an expert on this. Um, and yeah, many great people have done very good work and always have done, um, but it's, it, it's still not enough. So. I've tried really hard. Yeah, small people might be coming to interrupt. So um, we do have another question. I think um, Gopesh has his hand up, so I'll just. Yeah, thank you, Robin, first of all, for this very provocative and intriguing talk. Uh, I have like just three small queries. The first is like I wanted to ask about. I just like let me just put my video on. Okay, that's more cool. So uh, can you talk, throw more light about the diagenetic alterations, what you face in the tufa and also in a flow stone? So what are the major challenges over there? And second part, like you talked about the lateral extension of the flow stones, like saying it's called more of a local phenomenon. Like, do you see any kind of similarities in the Delta oxygen trends? So if we have a flow stone forming in the same period, they tend to have a similar oxygen values. So any similarities on those part? And third thing, anything about uh, dating about the carbonate or calcrete beds in the in, in, inland terrestrial areas, like not in rugged topography, which are completely open in the landscape. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much. These are three of my like favorite things to talk about. Um, I will try and answer, but if I forget anything, just interrupt me. So um, the diagenesis and the flow stones is a massive thing. I could have talked talk for 45 minutes about this. Um, yes, of course, there's diagenesis. We think it takes place early and it's conservative and the actual uranyl iron is very big and we don't think it moves basically. But this is a massive topic. Um, and Tara Edwards, and I've just written a review paper on this. Um, then the oxygen isotopes, um, I've done, we've done a little bit of work into this, but not exactly what you're saying, I have to be honest, in like trying to trace along a flow stream, because they can be very laterally continuous. Um, and the oxygen isotope results that we get aren't great. It's either just the same as the host rock, rock dolomite or a signal completely overwhelmed by evaporation. So, um, but yeah, this is also a fascinating topic and one that um, my colleague Tara is really trying to dig into. And then um, calcrete is my other favorite carbonate, which I didn't have time to talk about today. For decolonization, I had to sacrifice calcrete. Um, but yes, I've done a lot of work on calcretes on, in South Africa. 
And um, yeah, I've got some beautiful uranium thorium ages out of them. And um, I know as a rock type that you get all over the place in arid kind of badlands environment. Um, yeah, so I love concrete and it does look like we are getting some ages from them. I hope that answers your questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Like just one more I want to add, like I, I see other questions as well. Like in specifically, you talked about the billion environmental part of the flow stones, like in speleothems, everything is so controlled. So you have a very kind of a space dep deposition control. While talking about flow stones and billion environmental record from that, like you go, go for the bulk analysis or you still go for the different temporal slides, like for the sequential analysis, because the sequence could be, you might have some kind of temporal anomalies over there in terms of deposition or the records. Yes, so um, I think we just don't know yet. This is literally kind of work in progress is trying and like what's the best resolution. So we've done some laser ablation and stabilized isotopes at like 100 micron resolution. But then are we just seeing noise <laughs> or do is it better to sample at one millimeter? So we are literally kind of working on this and grappling with it. So you spot on, it's a fabulous question. We don't know yet. Okay, we've, um, we've got another question um, in the chat. So how do the wet and drier periods seen from your dating relate to the patterns of aridity in Eastern African sites? Yeah, so it's a super question. And literally the moment I plotted the graph that I showed you, I went and compared it to every single Eastern African lacustrine record that I could find. And there's no clear pattern, which I was a bit bummed about, um, but I think it's because these read they I mean these areas are you know up to seven thousand kilometers apart, so the local conditions and local climate drivers um, are different and kind of there's a lot of nuance here, um, and really kind of sitting down and comparing these is not it's a huge job and not really something that I could do in my office by myself. So I've had wonderful huge conversations with um, geologists who worked on the records in Eastern Africa, and we've kind of imagined doing exactly what you're saying. So um, yeah, there's no clear picture emerges yet. Um, okay, so we have Gabrielle with a hand up. We'd like to uh, unmute. Yeah. Can, oops. Hello, Gabrielle. Hello, how are you doing? I'm nice well. Call. Thank you. you very much. Um, I have two questions. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, question number one, I understood from Gail Ashley's work that the tufa formation, the tufa actually forms during the dry periods and not during the wet seasons. And I would appreciate if you could clarify this this for me. I don't quite understand the hydrology of, of the tufa. And the the other question is how do you fit uh, Makatanskat into the whole scheme? Mm. Oh, Gabrielle, you asked the hard questions. All right, I'll I'll do my best. So the I think with tufa formation you get this you get this kind of sweet spot, it has to be wet, but not too wet. And I think if it's too wet, you get carbonate dissolution. And instead of forming and building carbonates, you just wash them away. And then if it's too dry, you're gonna get nothing. So although Gail and I have talked about this very simple dichotomy of wet and dry, it's actually, of course, much more complicated than that. And um, what we do see in the Southern Kalahari with the two fur periods that Jay stated, if we look at dune mobility in the Kalahari, if we look at the Makarikari pans, if we look at all the regional records, we can, our tufa formations correlate to regional wet periods and the breaks in our tufa correlate to known expansions of the Kalahari. So we are quite comfortable in that this is a kind of wetter phase. Um, but yeah, it's a lot more complicated and I, I would love to sit down with Gail and have um, I think there's also different types of tufa, right? And it depends what that environment that's right for that tufa to form. And then yeah, um, I, I don't know, Gabrielle. I've, I've only actually been there once, to be honest. It is 
it is so big. I kept having to just sit down because I was so overwhelmed. The reason by why I ask is because everybody is assuming that Marco Panskat uh, is is wet or is much more closed than Stirkfontein. And it's older, right? And it's older, yeah. Yeah. So the only way we can really find out is to to date it, basically. Um, and um, I, Joe Walker did some beautiful work at Microfines that was never published. And I haven't dated any of it yet. Um, but yeah, the, the, we, we have a very interesting hypothesis and framework and how we fit Microfine in um, would be the most mind blowing PhD project. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm conscious of time. So we'll just have one more um, question. So from the chat from uh, John Gowlett, great science and very thought provoking. Are the errors independent in your dates? So if you date something lots of times, do you get a smaller combined error? Um, no, so uh, no, we don't do that. I know some luminescence people do this where they kind of um, do kind of weighted means on their, can kind of lump all their dates together and reduce the errors. But no, we don't do that. And our errors are contain the error of everything. So even the error on the decay constants and um, everything is all propagated through to form that final error. And we also report all our errors at a two sigma level. So things like um, some cosmogenic nuclide burial dating, they only report the errors at one sigma because if it was a two sigma, it would be really like enormous errors. So we are very, very conservative with our errors and they are likely, the errors are probably not, in reality, um, the date, the actual age is probably when that formed and the error is more a re uh, indication of how good those data are. It's not an age range. It's not saying that that flowstone formed between that time and that time. It's just a measure of how well we were able to um, yeah, measure all the various isotope ratios that go into calculating that age. So I hope that answers your question, John, and thank you for the nice comment. Okay, so I guess we'll, uh, we'll call it a day there. So thank you very much, Robin, for the great talk and uh, discussion. And thank you everybody for uh, coming along today. And uh, we hope to see you next week for our final uh, webinar of the programme. Super, thank you all very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Bye.